um, nonetheless wove this veil, sorry, wove this sail, parentheses, a veil. They did not use it to return to the former land, but rose up on this unexpected dumbfounded land. So what does a sail do for a boat? What's the significance of a sail on a boat? Gives direction. Gives direction. Essentially, it's the engine, right? So if you have the wind, the wind's going to push the sail, and that's going to allow the boat to move, right? So he says, this new population, they came together and formed a sail, not to go back to Africa, right? But to establish themselves in this new land the population that then formed, right? So we have scattered people from West Africa, from Ghana, from Senegal, from Nigeria, right? They're all placed on the bottom of this boat, trying to understand, trying to figure out what's going on, chained to one another, right? So a natural human experience, a natural human response is to try to communicate with one another to get an understanding of a circumstance, right? Even though we speak different languages, you're going to try to find a way to communicate. So this produces this new population, this new population that we call African-Americans or what I call Africans in America, this new population that we call Jamaicans, Haitians, folks from Trinidad and Tobago, folks from um, Belize, right? This is this new population that Gleason is attentive to. But something allowed them to create this cell, right? But what is that something? And he tells you in the, in the subsequent paragraph, it's knowledge, right? But then not just a specific knowledge, appetite, suffering, and delight of one particular people. Not only that, mm -hmm, Jen Lin, you're right. Jen, if y'all looking at the chat, Jen Lin is, is she's on. Uh, of, not, of one particular people, not only that, but knowledge of the whole greater from having been at the abyss and freeing knowledge of relation within the whole. So it's not just my knowledge of me being a con, right? And all the life ways of me being a con, not just the knowledge of me being Igbo from Nigeria, but the whole, right? The knowledge of, of having been at the abyss. So there's knowledge that's being produced by being chained to someone, right? There's knowledge that's being produced that when we get taken from the bottom of the ship and brought to the top of the ship, not everybody come back. Some people is getting thrown overboard. There's a knowledge that's being produced, right? There's a knowledge that's being produced in women when you see the woman next to you give birth next, like literally laying next to you, right? That produces a certain type of knowledge. So those experience is gonna shift your understanding of knowledge from being, oh, this is what it is from my land back home as an Akan to this is what my life is now, right? And that knowledge allowed them to forge this sail. Then he continues, for though this experience made you original victim floating towards the sea's abyss, an exception, it became something shared among us Sorry, something shared and made us. So, so this notice the shift from you to us, okay? The descendants, one people among others. Peoples do not live on exception. Relation is not made up of things that are foreign, but of shared knowledge. Relation is not made up of things that are foreign, but of shared knowledge. This experience of the abyss can now be said to be the best element of exchange. So he's equating this experience of the abyss as the impetus for relation. That's the best medium of exchange. Because remember, relation is not made up of things foreign, right? But of shared knowledge. And Gleason is saying relations, that shared knowledge is the abyss. That's what brings these people together. Right? And then he closes with his claim, this is why we stay with poetry. And for me, it makes me think of, um, of Ngugi, which we read last week. And it makes me think of Somme before Ngugi, who struggled with the conversion from their native language to English, right? From having to translate African happenings to English words, which there's no words to do. 
But Glissant says, ah, poetry. Poetry could fill that void, right? Because poetry allows you to do things with language, allows you to manipulate language, right? It makes language elastic. It makes language allowed to be manipulated. And this is why language becomes generative, right? Because all creolization is, from a language standpoint, is the manipulation of language. What poetry does to language, creolization also does to language. And this is what Glissant is getting us to think about. Um, I'm going to put my notes on pause there. Uh, we'll transition into our fishbowl. Uh, remember, you have two, one time to pass. You have to do two fishbowls per semester. You can talk about your journals. You can talk about your breakout rooms. Or you can talk about my notes. All that is on the table. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer? And if I call on you and you've already went twice, just let me know and you're good. All right. So, um, Heidi, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, sure. Okay. Thank you, Heidi. Um, Jasmine, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah. I'm sorry, Jasmine. I said Jasmine, but Jasmine, you responded. Was that yes? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so Jasmine, I know you have a computer issue, but we'll have Jasmine. Uh, Felipe, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yes. Okay, cool. So we'll go with um, Heidi, Jasmine, and Felipe. Whoever wants. Oh, sorry. I can go ahead and do the fishbowl, so okay, if cool. you don't mind. Yeah, we'll throw you in also, Nicole. So we'll have four, um, Heidi, Jasmine, Felipe, and Nicole. Whoever wants to start it off, it's on you. I can go ahead and start it off. Um, well, I just wanted to talk about like how I took in the reading and stuff like that. With my notes, I just um, know that this reading was about the Africans who lived through the experience of the, de the deportation. Um, the second abyss was like the depths of the sea um, how he talks about how through navigating through the sea where he was not able to see what was in front of him because of like basically being unprepared, mm -hmm. um, not knowing the challenges of what they were going to be facing because it's petrifying as he like says, um, he talks about how, um, uh, uh, what is it? Um, sorry, I'm going back to my notes. Um, he talks about how uh, the fleet of ships gave the chase to save ships. It was easier just to lighten the boat by throwing like the cargo overboard. Um, so. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay. Um, what I got from the reading was that he he came to a land that he didn't know like um anything. So he talks about like how there's like different people, different like creatures, and ha they have also different religions than he does. And that shows like a great example of how other people feel when they come from different places to the United States. All right, I'll go next. Um, what I wanted to talk about was tracing back our ancestors and our heritage. When you were talking about tracing your roots and stuff, I was thinking about back in high school, my junior year in my Spanish class, we had a project to trace our last name, right? And then I couldn't find nothing about my last name, like where it came from or anything. So I just felt like for me, I had a, a, a like a name that had no meaning, but I don't really like let it affect me. I just think that names are earned and that they don't define us. Thank you, Felipe. And uh, Heidi? Um. Well, I just wanted to talk about more about the abyss, I guess, from the reading. 
um, from my take on it, it's just while I was reading, um, when I think the word abyss, I, I think of solitude and like a coldness. So when I was reading, I thought oh, that any part, like in the parts of the story or the, uh, the book or the reading, um, that person must have really felt very alone and uh, cold to have write, written a, and compared it to an abyss. So that's that's just my take on it. So. Um, so I think you guys are really, what I've heard consistent, right, is the unknown as it pertains to the abyss. And I think that's like the most common way to understand the abyss. So he would have defined, he would define the abyss as the unknown. And then the work that the, that the abyss does is the, the metamorphosis, right? The, um, the boat, the ocean, all that's left behind. So I, I think if you're walking away with the understanding of equating the abyss to the unknown, you're, you're on board. Um, what I would like to do, though, to help kind of provide a clear depiction of, of what Glissant's thesis is, um, anyone familiar with, well, this idea of creolization, right? He dedicates the whole chapter to that. So this notion of creolization becomes very important. Um, anybody familiar with Creole culture, um, Creole culture, whether it be in the Caribbean, uh, possibly in New Orleans, anything like that? Anybody familiar with that? Okay, ask it yeah. this way. Jelani, okay. Uh, let me ask you this then, Jelani. Um, can you kind of explain to the, the class um, what this dish gumbo is? The Creole dish. The actual dish or, or the yeah. metaphor? Of no, gumbo? the actual dish, the actual dish. Uh, well, it's made with, you know, starting with the roux, which is the important with, you know, the flour and the spices, getting everything right as a base and uh, pretty much putting all, all sorts of vegetables, seafood, meat, uh, and a whole lot of love. It's, it's, you know, just a signature dish for African-Americans, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Okra, gotta have okra. Um, of course. Yeah. Yep. So Jelani is right, the, the roux, right? The broth is, is fundamental, right? That, like, like that. You can't really do gumbo right unless you give the appropriate love and attention to the roux. So you, you pour your broth in there and you pour your spices in there and you let it sit 15, 20 minutes. So that way the spices begin to kind of infuse themselves into the root, right? And once that's set for some time, then you dump in the sausage, crab legs, shrimp, um, okra, rice, et cetera, et cetera, your vegetables, corn, et cetera, right? And then you let that sit for, for 45 minutes to an hour. And what it is, is the infusing of all the varieties of flavors, spices, meats, seafoods, rice, etc., coming together to produce this one taste that we call gumbo. It's a perfect quintessential metaphor for what Glissant is talking about, right? So we have um, Africans on the belly of, on the belly of this boat who, who speak a variety of different languages, right? Think about the spices getting poured into the root, right? And those variety of different languages, when you're trying to understand your circumstance, is going to produce a form of communication, right? So, no, they may not have a central language on the bottom of that boat, but they had a means of communication. They found out within their nine-month journey that, hmm, this word is similar in my language to that word in your language. So we're going to continue to find these similarities and produce a means of communication. Right. So by the time you've gone through this nine month trip, you have a means to communicate. But then your trip is over. You're brought to the Americas. You're let out the boat. And the people who are overseeing the situation speak English. So you have the language that you created on the bottom of that boat. Infused with the language of your oppressor. And you're going to produce this language we call Ebonics or Pigeon English or what we now call African-American vernacular. You're on the bottom of this boat. You establish a means of communication for nine months. You get dropped off in the islands, right? The overseer to this particular island is from Britain, so they speak a British English. And the communication that you establish on the boat infused with this British English is going to produce a Jamaican patois, right? You're on your nine months journey. Uh, you get dropped off in another island. This particular island is overseen by those who speak French, 
So the language that you created on the body, in the belly of this boat is infused with the French language. And now you're going to produce a language that the, uh, the Creole language that the Haitians speak, right? So this notion or this idea of gumbo becomes very generative for understanding this notion or this idea of Creolization, right? Um, not today, but in the past, I play, I play a music, if you come early enough, it's, like, it's called Afrobeat. Right? Afrobeat is the same thing that Lisan is up to in our reading. It's the, um, the rhythm of African drumming, right? With the linguistics of dance hall Jamaican, right? With the rhyme style and rhyming pattern that become infamous with Americanized hip hop, right? So that's a, a musical tradition that embodies this notion of creolization. So what Glissant is attentive to is how things are coming together, regardless of what brings these things together, and how they produce a newness. How you can take all these varieties of spices and produce a dish called gumbo. How can you produce all these different music traditions and produce a genre called Afrobeat? This is where the Glissant's concern, his thesis is, is this production of the newness, right? As I mentioned, he's a Francophone thinker. He falls in the line of um, Amy Césaire, Franz Fanon, um, himself, right? All of these Francophone thinkers are concerned with this project of creating a new human. And um, Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask, he closes the book with this notion of developing the new human, right? Glissant picks this up, and he's concerned with this idea of the production of newness. And he says relations becomes key in producing this newness. So I'm curious um, with the time left to hear others' thoughts about the readings, um, any other questions that you guys may have about the readings or anything that still may remain unclear. Because I, I know this is not the most straightforward read, right? It's, it's a metaphor. Um, it's very, you know, interpretive. So any other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? We'll open up for, group, uh, for a close conversation. I thought that the a contemporary uh, analysis can be drawn from uh, immigration and a lot of uh, families being split. You know, we have a head of a household, we, whether the mother or the father going to a foreign land, uh, unknown, you know, not knowing what the circumstances are, if they'll ever come back to their family, you know, just for a monetary reason. So that that's sort of something that's, you know, a, a huge risk that people take. And it's sometimes forced. It's, it's not always a choice. Yeah. Um, I'm going to circle back to this immigration because that, that, this brings me to something else I want to discuss, but I'm going to circle back because Cassandra in the chat um, mentions the Harlem Renaissance. And I, I think you're absolutely right. This is a example of that newness. But but why, Cassandra? Can you what well, One, why do you think the Harlem Renaissance? And then why do you feel that's an example of, of the production of a newness? Well, from... From what I know, I don't think there had been like an established culture yet for um, Black people at the time. So it, during the 1920s, I think, was when uh, people started to, um, it, it, it allowed like time for, for creation. And um, yeah, I wish I knew more about it um, so I could speak more on it. But uh, yeah, that's all. That's what I know. So. What, what is a renaissance? What is a renaissance? Somebody... It's, just, it's like a revival mm -hmm. of something. And it's often articulated in the space of arts and culture, right? So in the 1920s in Harlem, they say a renaissance is produced, right? Um, you Jazz music comes on the scene. Um, you see a lot of Black writers kind of really get um, some recognition. Um, Ralph Ellison, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, the black aesthetic becomes a thing, a black look becomes a thing, right? And the Harlem Renaissance would produce individuals like James Baldwin, like Malcolm X. These are all byproducts of this Harlem Renaissance 
But yes, it creates this newness. And I, I wouldn't say that there wasn't a culture prior to the Harlem Renaissance, but I don't think that black culture was widely recognized as it became within the Harlem Renaissance, right? And to take it back to Glissant, right? What's happening in Harlem in the 1920s, people are migrating from the South and they're relocating to Harlem, right? So that's this melting pot, that's this um, belly of the boat, if you will, that causes people to throw their spices in the root to produce a new dish, right? So I, I, I would agree with um, your assertion, Cassandra, with the Harlem Renaissance. Um, yeah. This, yeah, also with the Great Migration, you know, I guess a lot, a lot of people were separated in the rural South, you know, and then they finally pushed into these cities, into the ghettos, and you got everybody finally together in one place. So they yep. finally get to share their experiences and, and, you know, create this new culture together. Yeah. And, and so what I would like to do is kind of go back to your um, musings on immigration. Um, so Glissant is focused on this idea of relation, right? And he's focused from a standpoint of African people, right? So he's concerned with how African people relate within this text, right? So how those who we call Jamaicans can relate with those who we call Nigerians can relate with those who we call African Americans can relate with those we call Africans who are, are, are born on the British, are in British soil, right? How they relate. But let's broaden this to a broader context. We have this thing called marginalized groups or what some may call minorities, right? And each of these minoritized groups face their own versions of abyss, right? The indigenous people had their own abyss, right? So whether you call yourself Mexican, Central American, Latinx, et cetera, right? You would fall under this category that I would call indigenous to this land. They had their abyss. We know about African people's abyss. We're reading that now right? Those who descended from Asia, they have their version of the abyss. All marginalized groups have, the, have an abyss, right? So what if we were to take this exercise that Glissant is causing us to be attentive to and apply it not only to African people, but to all marginalized groups? What would that do for the way that the world operates if all marginalized communities focus their point of relations based on each one of us going through their own version of the abyss. What would that do? So let's think about it this way. You cannot seriously talk about changing anything in this country without addressing at some level power, okay? So how can marginalized groups use this notion of relation and use this idea as the abyss, as a point of relation to shift power. What might that look or feel like? Like solidarity with different oppressed groups? Yep. So give me, in like in real time, Serena, like what, what, that, what might that solidarity look like? How might that actuate itself? Like if Various uh, oppressed groups could have empathy with other groups that felt this feeling of unknown and being in the abyss. Because, like everyone, I think that has been marginalized probably can relate to that experience on some level. So let me ask you guys: um, Is anybody paying attention to what's going on with the Haitians in Texas? Y'all familiar with that? Yes, no, kind of. Of course. Okay, so. Here's where, where relations comes into play for that circumstance, right? So Haitians are trying to migrate into the United States. They're stopped at the Texas borders. Y'all seen the images of what's taking place there. And then I've seen an article of the indigenous people of Texas, which you may call Mexicans, which you may call Latinx, etc. They're feeding the Haitians why do you think they're doing that? What would cause them 
to feed the Haitians, to go out of their way, to take food out of their kids' mouths to feed these Haitian people. Recognizing the, the common struggle, uh, you know, displaced peoples or just, you know, oppressed peoples, stifled peoples. They recognize that their abyss that they're currently in is an abyss that they've been through as a group. Looking at the chat, Jin Lin hits it, the nail on the head. Relation, right? This is Glissant's idea of relation in play in our now, right? So we in California, and let's let's like let's put all bullshit aside. Let's keep it real. Let's keep it keep it a, clean, a complete beam, right? If you live in Long Beach, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a tension. There's a beef. There's a rift, there's strife at play between the black community and the indigenous community, right? I don't, I'm not in Texas, so I don't know how that plays out. But these individuals in Texas are willing to bypass the fact that these black folks, these black Haitians, right? They're not worried about their ontological understanding of their color. They're not worried about any of that. But they recognize that their abyss is shared in my abyss. And because of that, I'm going to go out of my way to try to lighten your load the little bit that I can, right? And this is what Glissant is getting us, wants to get us to understand. This is what he wants to get us to focus on. Something as horrendous as the transatlantic slave situation can be useful for forging new community, right? Something as horrendous as forced migration, migration could be useful for forming, for forming new collect, uh, communities, right? So who knows what could, could ensue in Texas between the Haitian migrants and the indigenous people who are migrated to Texas, what newness can be produced there, right? But Glissant is saying if we are attentive to the forces that bring us together opposed to the forces that make us foreign, we have the opportunity to produce a newness. So his thesis is really about focusing on sameness, right? Focusing on relation to produce something new a new humanity, right? A new society, a new form of justice, a new form of harmony, a new form of understanding, right? This is what Glissant is getting us to, to consider, to contemplate, to engage and grapple with, right? And as poetic and abstract as it may read or sound, it has very real practical implications on how we live in our world today. And we're seeing that play out in the Texas border. Right. So, yes, he's talking in metaphor. But it's not all metaphorical. It has real material, practical consequences and circumstances. Right. So this is why this notion of relation, we've been dealing with this the whole semester so far. Right. And this text really puts this idea of relation on the table. Um, last minute, let's get two more comments or questions before we call it a day. Sebastian, what are your thoughts on the uh, reading or the conversation today? Um, I don't really have a comment, per se. I don't think I have anything to say. So do me a favor. Think about a question. And before we break out today, pose the course a question. Um, Jin Lin, you have been very um, on point with your understanding of relation. Um, as I as I kind of read how you engage the chat, can you got kind of what is relation doing for you in your cognitive process and the way that you're thinking about it? Can you kind of share with us some thoughts? Uh, what do you mean in my um so like because i'm just kind of move the way that you're moving through the chat and the way that yeah. you assert relations it seems that you have a very strong understanding of what glissant is wanting us to think about as it pertains to relations so how are you understanding this notion of relation i it just really spoke to me towards the end how he talks about um how that relation was able to form something the population i guess a new and I, I don't know, I feel like relation is also something important um, in the real world. So that last part just really stood out to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, I, I mean, it should at this point be obvious, right? But like, as an intellectual, 
I have been overly concerned with this notion of relation. Um, also, right, we're in the Pan-African, this is a Pan-African studies class. From a theoretical framework, Pan-Africanism is about relations also, right? Because what Pan-Africanism does is not focusing on how Africans who are residing within America are separate from Africans on the continent or separate from Africans on the, in the Caribbean. It focuses on our similarities, right? And this is the same work that Glissant wants us to think about through this notion of relation. Let's not focus on the things that divide us as a people. Let's focus on the things that can bring us together, right? And to me, this becomes useful and generative when thinking about organizing a society, right? Yeah, inclusiveness. Let's, let's, let's include everyone. And we have, this is, a, this is a society constructed on othering. What do I mean? What, is, what do I mean by that? This is a society constructed on othering. What does that mean? What does it mean to other? placing people in categories outside of the white majority. Yep. So someone besides Jelani, tell me what I mean when I say that this is a society based on othering. Doesn't it just mean um, based on one another? Based on one another? like um like all of us as a as a whole so, so that would be more aligned with inclusiveness right but if this is a society that's based on othering and jelani says othering is the science of putting people in categories that reside outside of whiteness what does that mean nicole uh i'd say like not fitting in like you have within the norms of the social groups. Mm -hmm. So such as you said, like religion, uh, orientation, age, all of that, I'd yep. say. Yep. Um, Cassandra, can you can you state out loud what you put in the chat? Because you're, you're absolutely right. Um, to other people is to polarize people um, to create power disparities. Yep. So it's kind of, I think it re reflects on that, like us versus them mentality. That's it. That's it, right? And our society is founded on that, right? What is racism? What is sexism? What is classism, right? What is homophobia, right? This is this othering. It's the antithesis to relation, to inclusiveness, right? Why is equity such a hot button topic right now because we have an inequitable society, right? So we have a, to the chat, we have a society that's focused more on differences opposed to similarities. So Glissan is posing the question, what if we have a society that's structured on the sameness, right? Patahotep wrote his text to create a society that's based on sameness, that will focus on sameness opposed to the differences. So this is what Glissant is getting us to think about. And again, we see the usefulness of this relations as it plays out on the border of Texas. Sebastian, you got something for us? Still couldn't think of anything. What questions did you put in your, put in your um, journal? It was more about like the meaning of abyss, his three abysses. Do you have a, a clear conception of the abyss now? Kind of. OK. Could you articulate for me um, your community's abyss? My community's as in like my race or like? Which are however you choose to interpret that. You could go with race, you could go with family, however you choose to interpret community. It could be historical or in the now. Well, like with almost the same with like let's say um my grandparents when they moved out to 
the America, like they had no one with them. So like they felt like they were alone. Okay. And, so, okay. That 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 works. And I think if we are to kind of relate that closer to what Glissant is up to, it's not the alone, but the unknown is what present what would produce that abyss for your grandparents. All right, but let's um 